Hi everyone and welcome to this week's online service at Eltham Presbyterian Church. My name's David and it's great to have you join with us today. Well, what a week it's been. We've had seven days in a row or with no new COVID cases and we're about to enjoy some increased freedoms. Whilst in Europe, they've had record numbers of cases and they're about to um, have increased restrictions. We've had the air conditioner on one day and the heater on a couple of days later. We've had an election in the US and both parties are claiming that they've won. What a world we live in. Thankfully, God is eternal and unchanging and totally reliable. In Psalm 122, it says that, In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing you will change them, and they will be discarded. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. The children of your saints will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you. Isn't it great that whatever happens, whether good or bad, we can rely on God and know that we can live in his presence. Later in our service today, Andy will be bringing us God's word from Romans, where we'll be reminded that we can live in his presence, whatever our background and whatever our life history. What a wonderful blessing that is. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the blessings you pour out in us. We are blessed to live in a city, a state, a country that now has minimal cases of COVID-19. We are blessed by the sunshine and the rain. We are blessed to live in a prosperous place with a relatively stable, democratically elected government. You are a good God. But the biggest blessing you have given us is to send Jesus to live a perfect life, take the punishment that we deserve for our sins, and then conquer death to rise again. We are so blessed that no matter our ethnic background, no matter what we've done in our life, we can live in your presence if we accept Jesus and trust in you. We pray that you'll bless today's service as we read from your word, sing, pray, and listen to Andy's teaching. And we look forward to the day soon when we can physically meet together again as a church community in corporate worship. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're getting ready to meet on the property again. And once we start doing that, you will notice that there are various signs around the place that weren't here before. Right up on our front fence, we have um, just in reference to the conditions of entry and reference to our ops, uh, website, um, um, the information that you need to um, register online for every event that you attend. And when you get here, um, you need to sign in to say that you were here. And, and the quickest and easiest way to sign in is to have a QR reader on your phone and you scan one of these things which are going to be placed in different places around our property. So you scan that and it'll take you to the form that you fill in and that guarantees that you've signed in as being here. You'll also notice when um, you come that all our major buildings and rooms have a number which says the number of people that are allowed in that building or the room based on four square meters and regardless of um, what the new regulations will be as of uh, uh, today maybe um, the maximum on four square meters for people in our church auditorium is 50 the maximum for people in the hall is only 20 but um, that's just to show that we were taking out the COVID regulations um, seriously and uh, let's be excited about meeting together even though things will be different and there will be limitations on space um, but perhaps it'll open up quicker than we even um, uh, are expecting at the moment so uh, please um, be mindful that we're still working on our signs we've got to work on uh, the cleaning regime that everybody's got to adhere to as well um, but please note, things will be different. Thank you. Jesus in the lion's den? I thought it was Daniel in the lion's den. Let's read the story and see what happens. Did you know that the oldest stories in the Bible are a bit like puzzles? If you look very carefully, you can spot some Jesus moments. Those are moments when someone in the story is a little bit like Jesus. 
So this book is about the real exciting story of Daniel. But what makes it even more exciting is that you can spot Jesus moments in it too. There are lots of lions in this story, but every time you see this special lion, it's a clue there's a Jesus moment too. Are you ready? Let's start the story. Do you have any habits? Maybe you sing in the bath, or twiddle your thumbs, or stick your finger up your nose, or yucky. This is a story about Daniel and his habit. It was a great habit, but it was a habit that got him into a lot of trouble. Daniel knew God, the real king of everyone and everywhere. Daniel loved God very much, so three times a day, Daniel knelt down by his window and he prayed. Prayer is talking to God. We can talk to him anywhere, anytime and about anything. What a wonderful habit. How could that get anyone into trouble? Daniel worked for Darius, the super powerful king of Babylon. Daniel was so good at his job that the king wanted him to run the whole kingdom. But the other people who worked for King Darius didn't like Daniel and they didn't like the God he prayed to. So they decided to get Daniel into trouble with the king. There was just one problem. Daniel had done nothing wrong. Nothing. But then they thought of something. They could use Daniel's habit to get him into trouble. Daniel's enemies got King Darius to make a new law. It said that for 30 days, no one was allowed to pray to anyone except the king. And if anyone broke the law, they would be thrown into a den full of huge hungry lions. Oh no, what could Daniel do? If he obeyed the king of Babylon, he would stay safe. But if he obeyed God, the real king of everyone and everywhere, he would keep praying. And that meant Daniel would be lion food. Safety or lion food? Which would Daniel choose? Daniel's enemies crept up to his house and looked up at the window. Daniel was praying. They'd caught him. The plan had worked. So they rushed back and told the king, Daniel was about to become lion food. King Darius tried and tried all day to find a way to save Daniel, but he couldn't. Even the king wasn't able to change the law. So when the sun went down, Daniel was taken to the den of huge hungry lions and thrown in. I hope your God can save you, said King Darius. A huge stone was rolled across the mouth of the den and everyone went to bed. But the king couldn't sleep. He tossed and turned and turned and tossed all night. In the morning, he rushed back to the den. Daniel, has your king been able to save you? Has your God been able to save you, Daniel? The king listened. A voice came from the den. Yes, O king, I am not hurt. God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths. God saved me because I have done nothing wrong. Nothing. Daniel was lifted out of the den and there wasn't even a scratch on him. Daniel had trusted God and God had saved him. Then, because King Darius was such an important king, he wrote to all the people in all the countries, in all the world, he said, Daniel's God is the living God. He is the real king of everyone and everywhere, now and forever. He saves his people. The end? Hmm, it's all been scratched out. I wonder what that means. Aha, it says... No, it isn't the end. It's time to spot some Jesus moments. Look back at the pictures in the book. There were lots of lions in this story. But did you spot the special line? 
He appears every time there's a Jesus moment in the story. Each Jesus moment is a moment when Daniel is a little like Jesus, the Son of God. Did you find all four? Here's what they need. Daniel's enemies wanted to get rid of him, so they tried to get him into trouble. That's what Jesus' enemies did to him too. But in his job, Daniel had done nothing wrong, nothing. His enemies had to invent a new law to get Daniel into trouble. In his whole life, Jesus had done nothing wrong, nothing. So his enemies had to tell lies about Jesus to get him into trouble. When Daniel heard about his enemies' plans, he knew he was going to be arrested and thrown into the lions. What did he do? That's right, Daniel prayed. When Jesus knew he was going to be arrested and killed on a cross, what did he do? He prayed too. Did Daniel die in the den of lions? No, the lions were very hungry and Daniel was as good as dead, but God, the real king of everyone and everywhere, brought Daniel out of the den. Did Jesus die on the cross? Yes, yes, yes. Jesus really was dead, but then God brought his son out of death. And do you know something amazing? God promises to bring all his son's friends out of death and into life with him too. Can God really do that? Yes, he can. He's done it before. So one day, all of Jesus' friends will live with him forever and ever. And for now, we can enjoy the same habit Daniel did. We can talk to the real king of everyone and everywhere, every day. Good morning, everyone. Today we're continuing in Romans chapter 11, starting at verse 25 and reading through to the end of the chapter. So Romans chapter 11, starting at verse 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on the account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his calls are irrevocable. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. It's now time for us to come together in prayer. As we come together, I wanted to read from Job 28, which is a great passage about where can wisdom be found. So excerpts from Job 28, beginning at verse 12. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? Man does not comprehend its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says, it's not in me. 
The C says, it's not with me. God understands a way to it. He alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. And he said to man, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. Let's come before our great God, our wise God, in prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are all-knowing, that you are all-seeing, that you are omnipresent, and that you know the beginning from the end. You are sovereign over all things. And Lord God, we thank you that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of life, the beginning and the end of history. And even though we stumble along as humans through this world, even though we have foolish schemes and good schemes of nations and rulers, all these things, whether they are good or evil or in between, they're all temporary things. And we're reminded of the words of Job when he said that you, Lord, make nations to rise and then fall. You build some up and you abandon others. And we know that it is only your kingdom, your rule, that lasts forever. And as we think of these things and have been swamped by the news of what is happening in the United States with their presidential election, we pray that we may continually turn to your wisdom and your power. And we do pray for the people of the United States that they might embrace unity within their diversity, that they might seek peace above personal power as they seek to unite as a nation and to live and contribute as a nation to the wider world. And Lord, we especially pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in the United States. We, may, we pray that they might be united in their loyalty to Jesus and to his gospel, that that loyalty to Jesus and his gospel would be above any political passion and commitment that they might have. Lord, we pray for them that they would be loyal to the kingdom of Jesus far beyond the temporary loyalty of political parties and even their own nation. We pray, Lord, that their passions and the adherence to the things that are temporary would not become a bitter, a bitter cause of division in the Christian church, the church of Jesus. And we pray for the unity of believers so that that unity would rise above all the social divisions that we have been made aware of in these days. And that they would rise above these social divisions and be a shining light on a hill that draws people to Jesus. That in a time of confusion, we pray that your people would be the solid foundation for other people to look towards. And Father, we pray for ourselves here in Australia. We pray that we too might always remember that our citizenship in heaven is what we should treasure the most. And we ask, Lord, that as we consider our citizenship in heaven, that that would free us from the bondage of extremes. We pray too that it might free us from the bondage of earthly fears so that we might be even more productive and more useful in the life that you have given us right here and now. As you think of what's been happening, especially in the state of Victoria, Lord, we give you thanks for the excellent COVID results this week. We rejoice in that. And we pray that you would spare us a third wave, um, that things would become stable from now on and we'd be able to begin to return back to life as we knew it before. And Lord, we pray for those in authority as they consider what restrictions to remove and maybe right in that process now. We pray that you might give them wisdom to balance many things as they consider not only the health of Victorians but the, also the financial aspect as, as well. And Lord, we pray that it might be very soon 
that we would have the pleasure of meeting together in substantial numbers rather than just in small groups. And Lord, we have often recognised that we have been disappointed with our own governments and the decisions that they make from time to time. But we pray that we'd always be mindful of your hand of providence is bigger than all of these things. And that your hand of providence is always with us. And we pray, Lord, that you would always be our anchor and our hope. And we ask that you would help us to have a teachable spirit within hardship and a grateful spirit in times of comfort and ease, that in all things we might walk humbly before you and seek justice and truth and live for Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Motel is a Jewish man who grew curious about Jesus. He'd always been told that the New Testament uh, was a Gentile Bible, and it was basically a handbook on how to persecute Jews. And he imagined that Jesus was Italian uh, because the only Christians he knew were Italian Catholic at the time. Uh, and so he was told by his friends and family to stay away from all of that. And his grandparents had told him that the New Testament was written by people who persecuted the Jews. And if you've ever thought of Jewish people of, as perhaps some of the hardest nuts to crack in terms of the gospel, well, his story might surprise you. One day he found a Bible in his local library. And as he read the opening lines, it struck him between the eyes. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. And he discovered a thoroughly Jewish book. And he says he came to realize that coming to faith in Christ was perhaps the most Jewish thing he could do. And he found that his Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, all pointed to Jesus. And you'll find his testimony uh, along with some others on our website, Think Life, Think Jesus. And you might like to check that out sometime. We've been in a short history of grace the last few weeks. And today we're up to the final in this little series uh, before we'll look on from Romans 12 next week. Uh, we'll cover this passage in three points today. Uh, I have these three words for us to remember it. Mystery, mercy and majesty. And so firstly, it's mystery. The master's mystery unveiled. Secrets revealed always gets everyone's attention, uh, especially when there are US presidents involved. Uh, this door can be found on the side street of the famous Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. It, it leads to a lift that goes underground to a, well, relatively secret subway station under the hotel that's connected to Grand Central Terminal uh, via a special track. And after the Second World War, it came to light that President Roosevelt, FDR, had secretly used the track to get into the hotel uh, when he was visiting town, supposedly to hide his usage of a wheelchair from the press. Don mentioned last week about the disclosure of God's secrets. Sometimes the curtain is pulled back a little and we're let, let in on something of the, the how, what and why of what God is doing in this his world. And Paul's been dealing with a series of questions uh, up until Romans 11. How do you explain the apparent widespread unbelief of the Jewish people? What's to become of them? Does Israel have a future? And so from verse 25, where we'll pick, up, pick it up, he's about to disclose that their present circumstances are not permanent. Have a look with me. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So Paul's just explained that God can graft them back in to the olive tree. 
Uh, and if he can do that, uh, if he can do it with Gentiles, he can certainly do it with the Jewish people. But it's as long as belief is present. Uh, and what he's argued for as a potential or a possibility, he's now going to state as a certainty. He said already that the Gentiles ought not be proud. And he's warned them about being arrogant because they've believed and the Jews haven't. Because it's not their own goodness that has saved them. And so now this is kind of by way of summary and explanation. And Paul's saying to his fellow Christians in Rome that he wants them to be fully aware of this mystery that's now been unveiled. That the present Jewish rejection of the gospel is for the sake of the Gentiles, the non-Jews, for the moment. And it's not so much a secret to remain a secret. It's a revelation to be made public. Uh, an open secret. And so Israel's present hardening is partial and not total. Temporary and not final. The hardening isn't the end of Israel's story. Uh, they have stumbled, but they've not fallen beyond recovery. And so God has his purposes in this, uh, so that the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, uh, the full number. And Paul's mentioned already about the full inclusion of the elect in Israel, uh, and that the Gentile inclusion uh, will be used by God to actually provoke Israel to jealousy. And, and he will use that. And so this has got to do with the gospel and salvation. It leads us to verse 26, uh, which sounds a little bit tricky, but we're going to try and explain it. Uh, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. And it's supported with some Old Testament here. So he goes on, as it is written... The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, before we get to talking about all Israel being saved, we ought to just remind ourselves about how salvation is possible at all. Because this in no way is suggesting that Israel can be saved apart from faith in Jesus, the Messiah. It's actually a given at this point in Romans. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in, in Christ's righteousness alone, uh, that Paul has been establishing all up until this point. Uh, the Jews won't be saved because of their adherence to the Old Testament law. Uh, they won't be saved because of their faithfulness to the covenant. Uh, they will only by, be saved through faith in Christ and, and what he's done. Uh, only by calling on the name of the Lord uh, that he explains in chapter 10. And so we can conclude from that. Well, there's really no second pathway to salvation uh, by simply being born Jewish or acting Jewish. Uh, otherwise, Paul wouldn't be so concerned for his fellow countrymen. Uh, remember, his heart for them is for them to be saved, and to put their faith in Jesus. And so this salvation is all about a deliverer from Zion. He is the saving one who we're waiting for, who will return again uh, to deliver us from the wrath to come. Well, that's uh, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, uh, to wait for his son from heaven, who we raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That is the hope of every believer. Uh, so what does Paul mean by all Israel will be saved? Well, let's, let's tackle that. Uh, it is sometimes used of all the people of God. Uh, that is Jew and Gentile. Uh, it's used like that in Galatians 6. Uh, but here, he doesn't mean that. Uh, Paul's just mentioned Israel in verse 25 uh, as those who are ethnically Israel, uh, as opposed to foreign people from foreign nations 
who we call Gentiles. Uh, and so it's ethnic Israel that he's saying at some point will be saved. Uh, the all doesn't mean all without exception. It is just speaking of Israel as a whole people group. So this isn't speaking of a political entity. Uh, it doesn't mention the return uh, to the land of Israel here. Uh, none of that is actually mentioned. Uh, this is speaking of their spiritual status, their salvation. Uh, it is elect Israel, uh, some amount of the total, perhaps many, who are saved, who will be saved. Uh, some people think that this is talking about a large-scale mass revival uh, among Israel, uh, that there will be some point in the future before Jesus' return uh, where they will turn to Christ in huge numbers. Uh, and that could be the case, and praise God if it is. Uh, but it doesn't have to be, uh, as we read this. Uh, the timing that Paul is talking about is seen by some other Bible scholars as more concurrent than it is sort of sequential. Uh, that is to say, this could be true of all ages up until the end point in history. Uh, and so in this way, uh, could mean that there will be a steady stream of ethnic Jews who come to faith. Uh, and that is... Uh, that's actually allowed with Paul's language here. It could mean an increasing number turning to Christ all the way up until one day most of Israel even uh, in the future comes to faith. Either interpretation there, that's a good thing, right? Uh, and the fact is that many Jews through the ages have put their faith in Jesus. Uh, and they are called Messia Messianic Jews, uh, and they exist all around the world today. So God hasn't given up on them, uh, and so neither should we. Uh, there's always something to learn from Israel, not least that God is patient with those who are obstinate. He can turn a hard hearted uh, heart of stone <laughs> into a heart of flesh. Uh, someone who's hardened into someone who is softened. Uh, and Paul isn't anti-Semitic. He, he loves his people. He's one of them. And, and actually, it's the most loving thing that you could do for them is to bring them the gospel, to hold out the person and work of Jesus, their Messiah. Uh, and that is what Paul is encouraging here. There is only one olive tree uh, to which both Jewish and Gentile believers belong to together. See, faith in Jesus is essential to that. Uh, there's no other pathway involved. Uh, and so there has to be a witness. The gospel needs to be offered so that it can be taken up. So you and I, with confidence can pray for and uh, partner with the work of groups like Celebrate Messiah uh, with Lawrence Hirsch here in Melbourne, uh, or Jews for Jesus, or, or Christian Witness to Israel, or, or any number of Christian organisations and churches who are seeking to proclaim Christ uh, in a Jewish context. It's not infertile soil that they're ploughing in. Uh, there's a promise here that God is not done with those who are his special people. Uh, even though they've been hardened, that won't always be the case. And so the master, the Lord of heaven and earth, has these incredible plans for his world. And it's extraordinary, isn't it, that he's unveiled something of that mystery to you and me right here. He's disclosed his plans in the gospel for both Jew and non-Jew. And that is the master's mystery unveiled. Well, secondly, uh, we come to the master's mercy uh, that is required by all. And Judaism's moved a long way since the time of the Bible. 
Uh, you might be surprised uh, to learn that even many Orthodox Jews today don't necessarily know the Bible very well. They're not really like the Jews that you and I might meet in the pages of Scripture. Uh, there's been a lot that's happened in the last 2,000 years. Uh, there's a Jewish Christian I know who, who thinks he just didn't know the Bible at all before he became a Christian, uh, even though he had to memorize parts of it as part of his upbringing. It was all in a language he didn't understand, and it was done as part of tradition and ritual and ceremony, uh, not from any sense of actually understanding those words. Sharon Summer was raised an Orthodox Jew, and she married one. She never associated with anyone who wasn't Jewish. Uh, she also never felt close to God. And eventually she began to understand that something was missing in her life. There was a time that she'd hit rock bottom. Uh, she was depressed. She was angry with the world, with God. Uh, and that was when her cleaner lent her a Christian book and suggested that she started reading scripture. And together they read Isaiah 53, and she realized she couldn't fight it any longer. Jesus was clearly the Messiah and her savior, and she saw her need for God's mercy. And then next she had to tell the family, and for Jewish people that can get a bit complicated. Uh, her mum freaked out and rang every rabbi that she knew. And one of them even got on the phone and rang her husband and gave him the advice to go and divorce his wife, uh, which fortunately he didn't. And the husband later on came to faith himself. Uh, you can check out more stories like those uh, on our Think Life website. Uh, I've put a few up of Jewish people who have come to faith in Jesus. And it might be something that you can point a friend to if you know someone with that heritage. Even if you don't, they're great stories of people coming to faith. Uh, there's been a really terrible history of anti-Semitism uh, over the ages, uh, culminating in the gas chambers of the Holocaust. There's been a history of anti-Jewish thinking, even in the church. And it needs to be recognised and repented from as a sin against God and humanity. Uh, there's also been historical neglect of these chapters in Romans. Uh, at best, it's then led to no answer to anti-Semitism. Uh, but even at, at its worst, it's actually even endorsed it. Uh, and so the New Testament was only translated into Hebrew in the 1870s uh, by a man named Franz Dalich. Uh, he was a Bible scholar who was probably way ahead of his time uh, in terms of promoting evangelism and, and mission to Jewish people all over the world. And, and post-Holocaust, there's been far more open talk of anti-Semitism. It's been exposed. And some now think that the Jews ought to be left entirely alone, uh, even without any Christian ministry contacts. And some people have even developed a, a fairly faulty theological basis for doing that. Uh, they think that the Jewish people have all they need with only the Old Testament. Well, clearly, that is not Paul's view here. Look on with me, verse 28. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Uh, and so their present rejection of the gospel is used by God uh, in his purposes uh, in order to bring his salvation elsewhere. But that doesn't mean that they are beyond his love and beyond his power to reach them. And the history of grace looks back and before it reaches forward. Uh, these people are loved because of these promises way back uh, in the time of their ancestors. Uh, and so long as they don't reject Jesus, well, the possibility of becoming Jesus' disciples 
remains graciously open to them. And one day all Israel will be saved. Well, that means one day they will stop being disobedient and come to faith in Jesus. Uh, verse 29, uh, I think it was John Stott thinks that this is the key verse in this whole chapter. And it's like a lesson in God's grace and faithfulness. So verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And it's a reminder that at this same covenant God uh, who promises to his people uh, these things will always keep his word. He never goes back on that and he hasn't rejected them. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 has these same concepts of gifts and calling from God. Uh, and so you might better relate to, uh, to this passage uh, where he says, He is the one who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not based on our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, granted to us in Christ Jesus before time began, and now made visible through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus. He has broken the power of death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. See, God is faithful even despite our unfaithfulness. In fact, there is no Jew or Gentile among us who is, uh, that isn't disobedient in some way. There's no one worthy of God's mercy. And that's where Paul goes in, in verse 30. He levels the playing field here. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order by the mercy shown to you, they may also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Now you note the word all there is used again. Uh, we need to be clear here, the Bible is not teaching universalism, yeah, that everyone is saved as such. It's, an all, it's not an all without exception. Paul is talking here about all the elect Gentiles and all the elect Jews who have not yet repented. Uh, his mercy will come on all of them. Uh, that is the promise. Uh, and that might seem a little bit theoretical. Well, that's until you throw yourself in here. You don't deserve God's mercy. The Bible says there is no one righteous. No one will earn their way into God's favour. You cannot twist his arm into accepting you on any other basis. He alone is the master of mercy. And that's why he sent Jesus. And he uses the disobedience of some to make the gospel overflow to others. And that makes both Jew and Gentile, every one of us, requiring of his mercy. And the church is, isn't full of those who have all got it together, figured God out. Uh, it's actually full of sinners who don't deserve his grace, who have discovered a merciful and loving God, uh, who has plucked them out of that disobedience and turn their hearts to Jesus. And what God does in his grace is that he liberates you from a life that's turned in on yourself. He saves you from you uh, and through Jesus, his redeemer. Uh, and so such is God's incredible mercy. Well, we come to the last point today. Uh, it's a bit of a tongue twister. The Master's Majesty Magnified. Try saying that 10 times quickly. Uh, if you've ever taught Sunday school or been in youth ministry or, or led a Bible study, here are a few verses to have up your sleeve uh, because it pretty much answers any question I've ever had uh, about God, life, the universe and everything. And it seems so fitting for the end of this section for Paul to sound this note of of worship and praise 
Uh, and sometimes the Bible brings all these threads together, uh, a bit like a symphony does. All the melodies and harmonies culminate in a crescendo uh, here in Scripture. Paul cannot contain himself any longer. The Master's plan is amazing. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. <laughs> Let's briefly look through these verses. Uh, and so we can say, firstly, God's ways are way beyond us. Uh, we've been scratching the surface only to discover that the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God go far, far deeper than we ever could imagine. Uh, they are the great riches of God's kindness and patience and his glory and his mercy uh, on the one hand. Uh, and then on the other hand, his incredible wisdom and knowledge uh, revealed so completely in, in his son, Jesus, and displayed at his cross. So his wealth and his wisdom, uh, they're inexhaustible. And you don't have to understand it all to be able to worship God. Uh, but because he has revealed himself to us in Scripture, it actually becomes the basis of our worship. You and I don't worship an unknown God. All our worship is a response to how God has revealed himself. Uh, it comes from reflecting on who he is and what he has done. Uh, and so we could say theology leads to doxology. Knowing God through his word leads to worshipping and praising him in this ongoing and genuine relationship. It, it leads to wonder and joy and hope and awe as to who God is and that we can know him. Now, secondly, and closely related is that you can know you can't know everything that he knows verse 34 for who has known the mind of the lord or who has been his counselor uh, it's isaiah 40. we're very quick to give advice to our leaders but it doesn't quite work with god you cannot offer him your wisdom or your counsel he is not a president or a prime minister in need of a good advisor you are not wiser than God. And so you need to let God be God and praise him that he does know everything and that his ways are not our ways. He is the greatest leader and the best place to go to get counsel for yourself. See, it's not God who needs the help. It's you and me. We need wisdom and counsel that comes from outside of ourselves uh, to know how, how best to live in this his world. We need him. And though he doesn't need us as such, isn't it amazing that he chooses to interact and to love and reveal himself to us? If we look at verse 35, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. Uh, I was thinking of the, uh, the Cadbury ad with the little girl who buys her mum a block of chocolate from the milk bar. And she sneaks in as her mum's on the phone and she pays with it with all her special little trinkets that she tips on the counter. Uh, there's a plastic coin, a, a couple of buttons, uh, the kind of things that kids keep in their, um, in their pockets. And you're somewhat relieved as the shopkeeper accepts it all and he plays along and she gets back her tiny little horse as her change. See, grace is not even that. You cannot give to God to receive what is even better than Cadbury chocolate. If grace is owed, then it's not grace. R.C. Sproul uh, wrote this, the very essence of grace is its voluntary character. God reserves to himself the sovereign absolute right to give grace to some and to withhold his grace from others. And we need to trust God in that. 
If you demand grace from God, will you misunderstand it? Only when you are clear that grace is free, that you can really know that you are wholly undeserving of God's salvation and then be truly thankful for it. See, all this leads to worship. Uh, that's what Paul does uh, in his concluding verse, verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. See, today we've explored the master's mystery unveiled, uh, his inclusion of Israel and those outside of Israel in his master plan of grace. Uh, we've seen that, all, that we all need his mercy, uh, that God's gifts and callings cannot be snatched away. He keeps his word. He shows mercy to the disobedient, just like you, just like me. And his majesty deserves our magnification. Knowing God's plans and purposes in this world ought to lead us to worship and to thank him and praise him and honour him as our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is sovereign over salvation. He is a God who is gracious and glorious. And so with Paul, to him be glory forever. Amen. Would you pray with me? Well, Heavenly Father, uh, we're amazed today at who you are and what you've done for disobedient sinners, for those who were dead in their trespasses and sins, uh, but in Christ have been raised up in new life in him. So we praise and glorify you uh, for from you and through you and to you are all things. To you be all glory and honour, majesty, dominion and power forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To God be the glory.
Thanks for joining us again today. Uh, let's finish with these words from Romans 15. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.